Good morning. <clears throat> Could I welcome you all to our service of worship here on this Lord's Day? Good to be together as we come to worship our God together. We have a number of announcements. We'll get through them hopefully very quickly. In terms of Ukraine appeal, if you are still wanting to contribute to that, if you could get your donation to Maureen, that would be greatly appreciated. Still a couple more weeks than that. So Ukraine Appeal, if you would get your donations to Maureen, that would be greatly appreciated. For the evening celebration on Friday the 13th for our 50th anniversary, if you want to come to the meal for that evening, and if you've hopefully taken a form, we need to get them back ASAP. We're going to give you one more week because it was drawn to my attention, and rightly so. Maybe there's a wee bit of disconnect between... Um, when we were saying the forms had to be in and then when the monies had to be in and some folks are thinking oh we've got until the end of april but we're going to push to next week so if you are hoping to go could you get your forms in by next week at the latest so that would be greatly appreciated i think we're at about 17 or 18 at the minute and um, we've got to just watch for numbers and um, to make it viable for the caterers and if it doesn't work it doesn't work you'll get your money back if you put money in and we'll work something out but if you hope to come along to that, please have your forms in by next Sunday. Good Friday communion service will be at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a Good Friday communion service here at 7 o'clock. We'll announce that again next week, but just to keep in your diary. Gareth, as you know, is doing a biblical counselling course, and he shared a little bit with us over the last year or so in relation to that and it's good for him to keep us updated on that updated on that and maybe you're wondering you know what's the difference between biblical counseling and ordinary counseling well this will give you a really good idea this little leaflet on what biblical counseling is all about so there's some leaflets out in the welcome area please keep praying for Gareth as he's gone through this course and he's nearly coming I think to the end of it so we thank the Lord that he's endured and persevered but he's really benefited from it so much Please keep praying for Gareth and for all others who do this course, who teach the course. It's a very important course indeed. Ladies of the PW, tomorrow at 2.30, you're having a program of music and fellowship as planned with guest musician Stephen and Friends. And you said it was Extol? Extol. So Stephen and Friends, a.k.a. Extol, that will be tomorrow at 2.30. All members, plus any other ladies and friends of the congregation, if you would like to come along, you'll be very welcome to the last meeting of the current session of the Listenerbreen PW. We would be delighted to have a good attendance and to enjoy a special afternoon. Could I also say Connolly Presbyterian Church, they're getting the little blue tokens in Tesco's for their, uh, I think it's the Connolly Presbyterian Epic and Shine Youth Group. So if you're shopping in Tesco's and you get your little, little blue tokens, if you could pop your little blue tokens into the Con Lake CPC and Epic and Shine Youth Group, that would be greatly appreciated. And then I think this is the last, I think this is the last announcement. I always get worried about announcements. Um, I can't remember what the last one was. Source, that's what it is. Our Friday night club source has gone really, really well. We're thankful to God and thank you for everyone who's been praying for Source. We're averaging between 45 and 50 kids every Friday night, which is really, really tremendous and we thank God for that. It's, it's a bit of a holiday club type theme or, or setting to it. You know, um, we do Bible stories, we do games, we do crafts, we do tuck shop and stuff like that. So it's gone really well and a big thank you to all who have helped to make that possible. For those who've been praying for it, for those who've been coming along to help. This Friday night will be our last Friday. We're, we have done it from January on like a pilot basis just to see how it would go. And this Friday night's our last night. We're trying to open it up maybe to the parents to come along and sit in, have a cup of tea and coffee. If you are free, it's always good to have a couple of extra bodies on site just for numbers and ratios with kids. We're doing okay, but we could always do with some more. And since it's the last night, hey, if you come along, you're not going to be asked to do anything until we decide what we're doing next. 
with the source. So please keep praying about that and thank you for all who have really contributed to making that possible. I think these are all the announcements. Oh, just one more. <laughs> I just remembered. Uh, obviously, these days of austerity and challenging prices, pound stretcher. I know you're not going to get much out of pound stretcher in one sense, but having said that, yesterday afternoon, unfortunately, I only noticed at 10 to 6. But if you spend over five pounds, everything else that you spend after that is half price. So if you spend 40 quid, you're going to pay 20 quid. I don't know how long it's on for. The girls in the shop don't even know how long it's on for. But pound stretchers, you spend over a fiver, then everything, even in a trolley, if it's full, you will get it for half price. It's good to be helping one another in these days of challenge. You might get something for your cupboard if you go along. You'll certainly get cleaning products and all other things. So uh, if you can, avail of that. These are all the announcements. <clears throat> We're just going to read a couple of verses from Habakkuk. And we'll just do the first slide on these wee verses first. And it says this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The book of Habakkuk is a fascinating little book. And when someone might ever say to you, do you know what, the Bible's outdated, it's not relevant to our times, Habakkuk is a fascinating little book because when most of the other Old Testament prophets are speaking a message from God to the people, Habakkuk is actually involved in a dialogue with God about the people. And a big question that he keeps asking is about, you know, about suffering and about why the wicked seem to prosper and all these different things. But the book of Habakkuk is interestingly in the context of international crisis because the Babylonian Empire is beginning to rise. It's defeated the Assyrian Empire and now there's the potential that it's going to move toward the people of God. So there's an international crisis, but there's also internal corruption among the people of God and the leaders of God's people. We know there's international crisis, crisis all around us. We know that even within our own lives, there's, there's corruption, there's sin, there's brokenness. And we need God to move, don't we? We need him to move in this world. We need him to move in our own hearts. And a gentleman by the name of J. Ronald Blue said this, the ever-present why is best answered by the everlasting who. We can all ask the questions, why, Lord? Why? 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 But the book of Habakkuk says the more important issue is the answer, and that is who? The everlasting God. We'll go to the next slide because we see that even though Habakkuk says if everything else is stripped away, but when you have God, you have all that you need. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. A feet will go through the darkened forest. A deer will go through a darkened forest. Finds its way, navigates its way, gets its way through and is able to go to the higher hills, to the higher heights. And for us it's a picture of steadfastness, of stability, that God will be with us even in the difficult places. And so we come this morning to worship the Lord our strength. Let's come to him in prayer before we sing to him in praise. Father God, we praise you this morning as the sovereign Lord of all. For as in the days of Habakkuk, so too in our day, you rule over all and you rule over us. You rule over all that happens on the international stage and you rule over all that happens within our own lives. Though the turmoil of escalating war looms near and the battles within our own hearts are clear, we declare with one voice that our strength is found in you alone. May we, like the prophet Habakkuk, acknowledge that even though all should be stripped away, whether materially, societally, or physically, when you are with us, 
we have all that we need. And as your servant remembered the past, the work of your hands and the fame of your name, standing in awe of your deeds, so too may we this day, your people among whom your presence dwells, may we echo his words that exalt your supreme rule and eternal ways. And so as our voices soon unite in the overflow of God-exalting praise, renew our fervor for your fame, free us from the shackles of conformity, deliver us from mediocrity, and all that you might receive the worship that you deserve. Let the words of all our mouths and the meditations amid the declarations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus, our righteousness, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this first one together. It's a new one. Uh, I popped it onto the, uh, onto the prayer group, so hopefully a few of you have had a chance to listen to it so that you can join in. If you know the piece, please do join in with us as we sing His Mercy is More. The more aware we become of our own sin, the more conscious we are of our own shortcomings and failings in light of a holy God, the more aware we become of His mercy. Our sins are many, but His mercy is more. So let's stand and sing this piece together and please do join us if you know it.
just finish with a traditional kids piece. He's got the whole world in his hands. God, as David has reminded us, as the song reminded us, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. If you don't think your sins are many, you haven't really grasped the reality of sin in your life. And if you haven't really grasped the reality of sin in your life, then you haven't really grasped the measure of God's grace to us in Christ. I hope you know that the sins in your life are many, but more importantly, that his mercy in your life is much more. Let's pray. Lord God, someone has once said that we have more in common with Adolf Hitler than we do with Jesus Christ. And that sounds to us like a shocking statement to make but yet the one who said it was making the point that we have more in common with Hitler in terms of understanding that we are nearer to him in terms of being sinful and so far removed from the righteousness that is Christ. So far above us and beyond us is that righteousness which we could never in any measure attain And Father, we pray this morning that we would be mindful that we really are a sinful people. That we are a people who do not love you, O God, as we should. We do not seek you as we could. We do not want you, Lord, as we ought. Forgive us. Forgive us, O Lord, when pride would even whisper, how dare anyone say, I am closer to Hitler than to Jesus Christ. But Lord, the reality is that just one sin is enough to keep us out of your eternal presence. And yet, O God, how we thank you in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we know that not one sin has been left uncovered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we come before you this morning, we come a people who confess, O Lord, we do say things that are hurtful. We think things, Lord, that are wicked. We watch things that we shouldn't. We say things, O oh God, that are not good. We do not love you or love others as we ought to. And for that, we say, Lord, have mercy. Forgive us, Lord, when we do not trust you as we should, when we're not resting in the righteousness of Christ as we should. Lord, have mercy. And we pray in these moments, O God, that whatever it is in our lives that your Holy Spirit would bring to our attention even now, whether it even be something not said this morning that shouldn't be said or something said this morning that shouldn't have been said, Lord, we pray that as we are mindful of that, that we would repent of that and confess it. Lord, have mercy. We give you thanks that in Jesus Christ we have that great assurance that as we come to him in faith, acknowledging all that was accomplished on Calvary, so we know that all our sins 
are forgiven. And that, Lord God, we walk afresh with you this day, mindful of your mercy, mindful of your grace. We know that where sin abounds, grace superabounds. And how we praise you for that grace in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, may your people now, having confessed our sins, having acknowledged that we are only righteous in Christ, may you free us afresh to walk in the knowledge of that cleansing in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So la last week, you remember, we started the commands of God, question one. And so hopefully that's going to come. Garth, I haven't got the flicker, so if somebody could operate that. Yes, that's great. So first question from last week, if you remember, was what is the first commandment? Does anybody want to be brave enough to answer that question? What is the first commandment? Or will we just say it together? And we'll watch for the dummy flutters, will we? Right, so what is the first commandment? The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. I have to say that was pretty poor. Right. Did you not do your homework this week? Anyway, there it is. Uh, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And we saw how we can put other things in the place of God in our lives. Right. So we're going to go on to question two. So that's the next slide. And the question two is, what is the second commandment? As you've probably worked it out by now. So here's the answer. So we'll bring up the answer. The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. So it's very closely linked to the first commandment, isn't it? So the first commandment, God says, don't put anything or anyone before him. And then this second commandment comes along and it says, don't create an image, don't carve for yourself an image that you then bow down to and put in the place of God. So it's very similar to that first commandment. Let's say it together, will we? I'll say the question and we'll say the answer a couple of times. So what is the second commandment? The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. We'll try it again. What is the second commandment? The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. So if you look at the next slide, you see God gave these commands to his people at a time when they were surrounded by other people whose common practice would have been to make for themselves these carved images and to bow down to them. In fact, when Moses came down off the mountain with the 10 laws that we're looking at together, with the tablets of stone, engraved on the tablets of stone, what did he encounter? Well, if he, he encountered his people had created this great golden calf. They'd smelt all the, all the gold down and they'd created this golden calf. They had made for themselves a carved image. They'd broken that second commandment. Now you might think, hang on a second, I don't have any little statues. I don't have any carved images that I bow down to and worship. Although if you look in some people's gardens or if you look in some people's windowsills as you walk past their houses, you'll see some people have little statues of Buddha or some other god. You can see them. So it actually it does happen still today that people create these little images, these carved images for themselves, man-made but I don't have one of those in my house and I don't have one of them in my garden and you probably don't either. But look at the next slide. And it's a bit like what we said last week. What about the idols of my heart? And what about the idols of your heart? You see, an idol is something... Oh, actually, the next slide says it better than I could say it. If I bring up the next slide, it's this. Idolatry. Creating an idol in my life is making a good thing the ultimate thing. It's making, remember the good things we looked at last week, do you remember? That we can sometimes put in the place of God. School, it's a good thing, but some boys and girls and young people get so obsessed with school that it becomes far more important to them than anything else. Your phone, I mean, I mean the technology in a smartphone, you have the world at your fingertips. 
That can't be a bad thing. Well, it can, actually, when you become obsessed with it. And how many of us as adults and how many of, of, of us boys and girls and young people have become obsessed with that piece of technology that stays in our pocket? We put it in the place of God. They're all they're good things, sports, friends. They're all good things, but when they become the ultimate thing, do you know what I mean by ultimate? The best, the most important, then they become idols. And there's a verse in the Bible about that, and it says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. L listen to this. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. What a warning for us, and what a warning for me. Keep away from anything, anything, not just some carved statue, anything that would take God's place in your heart. Anything that means he is relegated from position number one in your life, stay away from it. Well, that's a hard warning to heed, isn't it? We have to pray for God's strength to help us to heed that warning. So we'll flick back to the question, if you don't mind, um, uh, Michael, thanks. We'll flick back to the question and we'll say it through a couple of more times together. What is the second commandment? The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Right, one last time. What is the second commandment? The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. All right, I think Christine and is it Molly, I think, or somebody who... Uh, and Marlene as well are going to take boys and girls out for uh, Transformers, so off you go there. Just a few points for our prayers of intercession. We, we are living in a very changing world, aren't we? And it's rapidly changing in many different ways and not for the good in many regards. Here are just some things that are happening within our society um, in recent days. Some here some not here yet, but in other parts of the UK. Peaceful protests outside abortion clinics are to become a criminal offence in Northern Ireland. So no longer, there's kind of buffer zones. There are certain zones now, perimeters, that you're not allowed to stand within so that you can't approach anyone who's going to an abortion clinic, even to say, look, can we have a chat about this? Maybe just see if there's a, let's talk about a different way or, or so on. But it's now become, uh, becoming a criminal offence in Northern Ireland. Lord Forsyth's assisted suicide amendment uh, was defeated in the House of Lords. Um, now that was a, a, a good thing in, in the sense that they, it's a major upset for the assisted suicide lobby who were expecting to win that vote. But they're going to push hard against that. Again, so obviously there was amendments um, that were wanting to be put to make it easier for suicide, you know, uh, assistance, assisted suicide. Uh, but thankfully that one was defeated, but the, the campaigners for that are coming hard against it again. Schools are having to embrace, it seems, a particular, or will have to embrace a particular ethos and ethics with regard to teachings of relationships and sexuality education. Uh, and it seems that even um, UK government might be going over the heads of school governors, teachers, parents, and locally elected representatives here in Northern Ireland to implement stuff that will be taught in schools that parents and governors will not necessarily have any say in whatsoever. In Wales, a mild smack can now risk arrest and a criminal record. An online safety bill is being introduced which will actually curtail what you can and cannot say on the internet. So the government then becoming the, the police, if you like, to say, well, this is okay to say and this you cannot say. DIY abortions have now become permanent in England and the government conversion ban will go ahead. Now, the conversion ban 
Um, is, is that in relation to having even a conversation with someone who's same-sex attracted and if you as a Christian say, can I have a chat with you? And they agree to that and you offer to pray for them or even if they ask you to pray for them, that that now might become illegal. Maybe not quite yet here, but there's a potential for that to come. The government were initially saying they're not going to interfere with this, they're not going to impose this because of church's understanding of the Bible and their theology and so on, but it seems there's pressure on them to change again and to backtrack on that. So these are all kinds of things that are happening within our society. And we're asked to pray for our rulers and those in authority over us. And we see that there's a lot that we could bring here this morning. We're going to take a moment or two to pray. Uh, but if you have other issues that you're mindful of, please bring them to our attention. Uh, but also keep these before God in prayer. So let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we, we're mindful since the very beginning of Genesis, since that first rebellion happened, that, Lord, there's rebellion happening in all kinds of ways and has been happening down through the ages right until this present time and will continue until the Lord Jesus returns. But until that time, Father God, your word bids us to pray and to seek your face and to seek for your guidance, to pray, O oh Lord, for wisdom for our rulers, for those who would want to stand up in terms of for righteousness' sake, for your name's sake, for those, Lord, who would challenge the, the changes that are happening in, in a rapid way in our society, Lord, which are, are frightening in the way that they are being readily pushed and accepted in many regards. So, Lord, we want to bring before you some of these issues this morning. We know we can't go into them, Lord, in all the ways we would want to, but, Lord, we, we just pray for those especially who are going to abortion clinics. Something like 43 million babies are aborted worldwide every year, O oh God. That's the population of the Ukraine or thereabouts. Lord, what must your heart be like toward 43 million little ones being aborted? every year. We pray, Lord, for your spirit to move. We pray for those legislative bodies which have sought to introduce these regulations, Lord, which are going to prevent anyone from even daring to want to get close to pastorally encourage and lovingly get alongside those, Lord, who are going to make decisions of which we know there are all kinds of ramifications that aren't seen in the immediate moment. Emotional impacts long-term impacts, Lord, even physical impacts in all kinds of different ways, and spiritual impacts. Lord, we pray for those who would seek to get alongside, who would be wanting to still protest. We pray you give them wisdom, give them grace, give them gentleness, yet with courage, we pray. Lord, for those families now in Wales who will be afraid to even discipline their children with a, a gentle tap on the thigh because they might be fearful of being reported to the authorities and getting a criminal record. Lord, we pray for wisdom. We know, Lord, increasingly these laws and the legislation being introduced goes contrary to your word. And Lord, we, we know that we want to protect our little ones. We know that we don't want any parents to be extreme in their discipline, and we understand that, O oh God. But Lord, we know that there is a place in a right way, in a controlled manner, in a loving fashion to discipline according to your word. O oh Lord, we just commit our own governing bodies to you, and we pray that you would give them the wisdom that they need. We know, Lord, too often at times consultations are put out into society and when the voices speak to say, no, we don't want this to go forward, often those consultations are ignored. 
And we've seen that, Lord, so often in this province, especially around the abortion issue. We pray, Lord, regarding our schools. We know, Lord, that there are things that are potentially going to be taught in our schools, even amongst primary age children, that we would never want them to hear about or to be discussed. And so, Lord, we pray for governors, we pray for principals, we pray for teachers, we pray for parents, Lord, that you would give them courage to stand up and to protest against these implementations that are coming down the line. But to do so, Lord, in a way that is not criminal, that is not breaking the law, but, Lord, seeks to actually uphold the greater law, which is your law. And so, Lord, we just commit these issues to you today. We know, Lord, they are so complex in many ways. They are so straightforward in other ways. But, Lord, help us to bring them before you consistently and continually. And may we find more information that will help us to pray wisely about these challenging and changing situations we ask. Hear us, we pray. And, Lord, as we come to your word, We pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts as we hear. But, Lord, we pray, too, for your offering to be received. And we pray that the gifts given here today, Lord, would honor you and the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your offerings will be received. Our scripture reading is John. John chapter 15. If you have your Bibles with you, if you have your phone and you're looking at it on your phone, John chapter 15. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 8. It also will be on the screen as well. Let's hear the Word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes or cleans, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of God. If you could sum up your life to this present point in time, or what you hope your life will be from this point on in time, if you could sum it up in terms of a fruit basket, How fruitful would that basket be? Would it be full and overflowing? Or would it be just a little bitty bowl with a couple of wrinkly apples in it? Is that how you might sum up the fruitfulness of your life as a follower of Jesus Christ? Would you be a basket full and overflowing with all kinds of different fruits and flavors and colors and ripeness in it? Or do you think, no, probably my life, it's just a little itsy-bitsy bowl with a few wee wrinkly apples in it. Well, if that's you, then you need to hear this morning that Christ doesn't want that to be you. Christ wants your basket, as it were, the basket of your life that represents your life. And I know it's a hard, maybe, thing to envisage and gauge in terms of measuring fruitfulness in our life. But Jesus simply and clearly is saying in John's Gospel here, I want you not only to live a life that is fruitful, but a life that is very fruitful. That there would be much fruitfulness in your life. 
And that's what Christ, we see clearly, is saying to us here in John 15. In verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And why is Jesus wanting there to be so much fruit in our lives? Well, in verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And the interesting thing that when Jesus makes his seventh and final statement in John's gospel about being the true vine in this gospel, that's not just some plucked out of the air statement that Jesus has made. Because you see, in the Old Testament, God often referred to his people as a vine or a vineyard. In Psalm 80 verse 8, you brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and you planted it. Jeremiah 2.21, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. Under the Old Testament covenant, God is saying to his people, I want you to be a fruitful people. I want you to be a people so that when the world looks at you, it sees something of me. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. And there are all other kinds of things that were to characterize the people of God, which we'll see in John when we come back to John after Easter. Love is to characterize the people of God. Joy is to characterize the people of God. That's the sort of fruitfulness that is to be seen in our lives. But under the old covenant, there was always a problem. The people of God just did not live as the people of God. And Isaiah 5, 4 says this, where God says, what more could have done from, been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? But in Jesus Christ, we see the true vine. In Jesus Christ, we see one who implements the new covenant, which now through his shed blood and through that reconciliation and restoration and redemptive relationship with God the Father, it now is possible for the people of God to be the people of God as God wants his people to be, a holy people, a fruit-filled people, a people who show something of the character of God in their lives in an increasingly abundant way. And Jesus says this is possible. And it's not by accident, is it, that Jesus has already shared from the fruit of the vine with his disciples in the upper room, as they've shared around the cup with the institution of the Lord's Supper. And even there, they would get a visual image of that which has been good fruit, which has produced the fruit of the vine, which they have shared together around the cup. And that cup which Jesus says, we will no longer drink of it together until that day when we are with each other in my Father's kingdom. But until that time, Jesus is saying, you can be a fruitful people. You can be a people who show my life in your life. I am the true vine and you are the branches. So this morning we want to look just at three things in John 15 here that will help us see how it is possible for us to be people who live the fruitful life. Because maybe you're still sitting here this morning and maybe you're going, ah, oh, you know, me, I, I'm nobody, I'm a nothing, I'm just a little, you know, I'm a little minnow in a big sea of faith, you know, you know, I'm not, you know, like that big evangelist or I'm not like that, you know, Christian over there and I'm not like, you know, me, I, yes, you can. Jesus is saying this to every single follower of his. You are called to live a life that bears much fruitfulness in it. And so we're, we're just going to look at these three things. And the first thing we're going to look at is the intimate care of the Father. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. NIV will say, my father is the gardener. I am absolutely not green fingered at all. The only thing that I can do is push a lawnmower. And as long as the lawnmower goes in a straight line, that's pretty okay for me. And that's about as good as it gets for me. But Jesus is here telling us that the father is akin to a good gardener, one who tends the you know, the, the vines, one who tends the garden, who looks after it. And we're going to see that there are two things that this passage tells us that the Father does in verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, 
while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, when we look at a verse like that, there are many who are of the opinion that what this is actually speaking about, when it says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, is that he's speaking about those who seem to be in Christ, but weren't really in Christ. And they would cite Judas as being the perfect example in the upper room who left before they shared the cup of the Lord's Supper. I see a beautiful bunch of flowers here this morning. And you wouldn't, I think they're imitation, but they look really real to me. I remember one time I went to a garage and I bought a bunch of flowers and I brought them home. They were in a bucket of water in the garage and I gave them to Laura and she smelt them and I noticed her face was a wee bit, there wasn't a great smell off them. Took them out to the kitchen to cut them and of course they were plastic. I didn't know they were plastic. They looked so real to me. And why they're in a bucket of water, I do not know if they were plastic. But imitation can look the part many times. And some are saying that verse 2, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, is speaking about imitation Christians. Goes on to verse 6, if anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and wither such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Most commentators are of the opinion that that's what this verse is speaking about. But I am not so sure. Not because I'm a great biblical scholar, but there is one commentator who puts it in a way that actually draws my heart towards it and my mind towards it. And it's a gentleman called James Montgomery Boyce. And he's actually saying, no, this is the father doing two things for the child of God. And we'll just look at that in a moment. And here's what he says. That word cut off actually has four meanings. The first meaning is to lift up or to pick up. The second meaning is to lift up figuratively as in lifting up one's eyes or voice. You know, if I lift up my eyes, I'm not actually physically, you know, I might do that. I'm lifting up my eyes. So in that regard, to lift up with the added thought of lifting up in order to carry away or to remove. Most commentators go for number four. James Montgomery Boyce says, actually, well, that's not the best move because in terms of the sequence of the verbs in the passage, the best one and the most sensible one is actually number one, to lift up or to pick up. And here's the idea. If you're in a vineyard and you see grapes on the ground, grapes do not grow on the ground. They need the air and they need the sunlight. So you need to lift them up off the ground in order to hang them up so that they get the required, you know, sunlight and air that they need. And here's the idea. James Montgomery Boyce believes that the first thing a gardener would do and a vine, you know, a vine dresser would do if they saw grapes lying on the ground, it wouldn't be yank them away because they're fruitless. No, the first thing would be, let's give them an opportunity to grow. So let's lift them up. And the idea is that the Father comes along at points in our lives when we're struggling as Christians and maybe we're not producing the fruit we should produce because there's all kinds of stuff going on in our hearts and in our our lives. And there's sometimes when the Father just comes along, as it were, and like the vine dresser, he just lifts us up. He, He gives us an opportunity, as it were, to bear fruit. We see the other thing that he does, as we read in those verses, While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And the pruning process, the idea of a cleaning process, you know, whether it might be looking at insects that are on the vines or whether it might be, you know, taking off a little bit here that's not good and a little there's not good. So we we get two ideas in this, if you like. We get the tenderness of the Father and we get the toughness of the Father because you need both, don't you? You know, a father just can't be tender all the time Sometimes a father has to be a little tough, but that's for the good of those, for his children, for example. And a gardener sometimes has to be tender and delicate with all, you know, these little flowers that might need careful attention, and if it was a vine dresser to lift them up. But there are other times when the pruning process has to come along, and that can be a bit more painful. 
And sometimes in our lives, the tenderness of the Father might be if you're struggling with not having Christian friends in your life, in your life, and you need someone to get alongside you to encourage you, and you don't know where to go, and you don't know how to find them, and you don't know how to get them. And sometimes God the Father will just take you, unbeknown to you, to a place. You get chatting with someone. It could be school. It could be college. It could be university. It could be somewhere. And you get talking with someone, and you realize... They know God. They love God. And you become friends, and God encourages you. He lifts you up, in a sense. Someone who can help sharpen you as a believer. But there are other times there might be friends in your life that shouldn't be friends in your life, who might be bringing to your life things that are not good for your spiritual life. And sometimes the Father has to prune a little bit there, and He might actually take you away from that situation or take them away from you because they're not good for you. And they're not helping you. You know, the little verse says, bad char- or was bad company corrupts good character. And there's that idea where the Father sometimes is a little bit more tough on us. And as David shared with us, even good things, if they become ultimate things, can harm our relationship with God. And Jesus saying, my Father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch of me that bears no fruit. He lifts up those who are struggling those who are withering in a sense in their Christian faith. And he prunes those who are even being fruitful so that they may become more fruitful. And it's not an encouraging word this morning that you as a follower of Christ can be, should be more fruitful. Because this is to the Father's glory, Jesus said. And he wants you to be fruitful. And James Montgomery Boyce would go on to say, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. He's saying they're like a branch. He's not saying they are a branch. He's just saying they're like a branch. But a vine branch was one of the most useless branches you could have if it was all dried up and decayed. Even in terms of burning it, that was about the only thing you could do with it. And it didn't even help stoke a good fire because it burned up so quickly. So it's just like, oh, let's get rid of it. And it's gone. And this, James Montgomery Boyce believes, is more a reference to the works of the Christian, to how we serve. And if we're not serving God in the way that we ought to serve God, and we'll see in a moment some of the way we ought to serve God, and if we're not serving God, then it's just like we're just like a dried up, crusty old vine. And when it comes to glory, it will just be like wood, hay, and straw. There will be nothing brought with us of eternal value in that sense. Our salvation will not be lost. But in terms of the rewards for serving Christ, they will be lost if we are a useless branch. But we don't need to be a useless branch. This is the whole point of what Jesus is saying in John 15. To help us be fruitful, we get intimate care. But we also need diligent effort. How many times in this passage, if you read through, did you see the phrase, remain in me? Remain in me. Remain in me. Unless you remain in me, you have to remain in me. And now when we're speaking about the Father giving intimate care, we need to be mindful that we just don't take that as a word to then, well, that means I just sit back and I do absolutely nothing. I don't need to do anything in terms of, you know, developing my own walk with God so that I become a fruitful person. Paul uses all kinds of imagery, doesn't he? And even in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 8 to 9, he says, as the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. And each will be rewarded according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. This is in 1 Corinthians in reference to the division in the church about some saying, oh, Apollos, he's the best preacher in the church. Others going, oh, no, Paul, he's the best teacher in the church. And Paul's saying, look, it doesn't matter who you think is the best preacher or teacher. You know, I plant the seed. Apollos, he waters the seed. But at the end of the day, it's God who gives growth to the seed. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But he's still saying they each have their role and they each have their purpose, but they're both laboring for Christ. And the idea of working and laboring is not an idea of idleness, but it's graft and it's pursuit and it's effort. 
He uses the image of a soldier. He talks about fighting the good fight of the faith. He says about, I buffet my body. And we've said this before, and I heard this somewhere where someone said, you know, as Christians, we more like to buffet our body as opposed to buffet our body. But Paul says, no, I, I, I beat my body in a sense. Don't mean, you know, this flagellation, but all he's saying is I'm disciplined. Physical training is of some value, but spiritual training has value for all things. He's like an athlete. He's like a boxer. He's like a workman. He says, I'm a slave. I'm a servant. I'm all these things because I put in diligent effort to ensure that I am the Christian, the follower of Jesus that he wants me to be. But so often we are like, oh Lord, why don't you just use me? waiting for the zap. Please just use me. Are you spiritually being diligent in reading the Word of God, in praying to God, in seeking God? Let's say we did a survey of the congregation, and the questions were these. Now, we're not doing, and we're not going to do it, maybe. If we do it, it'll be anonymous. You don't put your name on it. You don't, whatever. But let's, let's put, say there was a survey that went out. How many minutes a week would you say you give to personal prayer? How many minutes a week would you give to Bible study, to your own personal study of the Bible? Is it one hour a week? That's like, I think eight and a half minutes a day? Is it two hours a week? That's about, I think, 17 and a half minutes or thereabouts, maybe 18 minutes a day. How much time do you and I give to the personal study and the reading of God's Word? Now, that's not being legalistic. That's just being realistic and saying, are we diligently putting in the effort to grow in terms of our fruitfulness? Because imagine an athlete, you know, they have to put in the effort. We see them run on a track and we go, oh, that looks like so, that's easy to them. They're just running with ease. But don't forget, a lot of effort comes before the ease, but so often we want the ease before the effort. But it's the effort that goes before the ease. Someone on a ski slope, I would love to ski, but I'm probably never, ever going to do that until I go to glory and I'm praying that there's snow sometime where I can ski. But you know, when you learn to ski, you fall and you wobble and you don't get it quite right, but you, you get your posture and you get your balance and you fall and you get up and you get your posture and you get your balance and you try and you try and you try and you try. But then it gets to the stage where after all that effort, the ease comes. And why is this important? Well, in our opening call to worship, we saw the prophet Habakkuk, he says, even though there's no fig tree, you know, figs on the trees and no sheep in the fields, when everything is stripped away, I have you. And he knew he had God because he knew the Word of God. And if you put in the effort to the Word of God, when those difficult days come in your life, what becomes the easiest thing then to do? It's go to the Word of God. But if you've never put in the effort, when the struggles come and when the heartache comes and the hardship comes, what's the easiest thing to do? Is to go to everything else other than the Word of God. It's to go to everyone else other than to the God of the Word. Jesus wants us to be diligent in our effort. The Father cares for us. We're called to put in the effort. But lastly, and quickly, humble reliance. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The top, no branch can bear fruit by itself. 
neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Jesus is reminding us we're called to put in the effort. We know that the Father cares. We know that there will be that tenderness and that toughness with us. But ultimately, we must realize too that it's total reliance on Christ to do in and through us what we cannot do in and through ourselves. So it's relying on Christ to help us read the Word of God so that when you read it, you read it until you read it. So that when you pray, you pray until you really pray. Jesus says, you cannot do absolutely anything of eternal value without me. You need me. You must depend on me. You must remain in me. You must make the conscious choice and decisions to sit with me. Mary and Martha. Martha, Martha. Mary has chosen the one thing and the right thing. To just sit and remain at my feet. I'm going to close with this. I heard the story of a gentleman who was not a Christian, and he was out for a walk on a lovely scenic route with a friend who was a Christian. And the man who wasn't a Christian, he walked along with his friend, and they came to a nice little spot, and he said, oh, this is a lovely little spot, isn't it? I want to give my life to Jesus here. Let's do it. His friend said, no. Let's go. Kept walking. They walked a bit more, and it was a lovely day, and just a beautiful spot, and the guy stopped, and he turned to his friend, and he said, this is a lovely spot, isn't it? I could give my life to Jesus here. Let's do it here. The guy said, no. Let's keep going. And they kept walking. And they walked a little bit further, and they stopped again. He said, oh, surely this is a great spot. I look at it, you know, it, I can give my life to Jesus here. And the friend went, no, let's just keep walking. And as they walked along, the man just suddenly stopped and he turned to the Christian and he said, don't you say no to me one more time. I want to give my life to Christ. Okay, now you're ready. See, before Jesus was just a little add-on, Oh, this is a nice wee spot, isn't it? I give my life to Jesus here. It's nice. We just. But when he got to that place of, I need Jesus, that's a different place in the journey. Is my reliance on Christ and your reliance on Christ like we were crying out to him for our salvation? Lord, bear fruit in my life. Lord, would you make my life not just a little bit fruitful, but with much fruitfulness in it, much more than I can think or imagine. Pray until you pray. Read until you read. Put in the effort that you need to put in, not out of some legalistic obligation, not because you're trying to earn something from Jesus because he's won it all for you, but Jesus himself put in the effort, didn't he? He learned the Scriptures. He knew the Scriptures. He took time to pray. He took time to fast. He took time to seek the Father. And he did all that he did on the cross so that we don't do anything to earn our salvation, but can draw from him the vine and we are the branches and say, Lord, help me now to live in the way that you want me to live. I am the vine. You are the branches. What do you want that basket to look like when you stand before Jesus? A basket that is full and overflowing. It doesn't need to be a little bow with a couple of wrinkly apples. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will speak into our lives with your grace and mercy. That, Lord, we, don't know, we know that it's not by our effort that we are saved. But as those saved, we are called to effort to fight the good fight of the faith. Lord, to give our all to you, to walk with you, 
to live for you, to love you. Lord, would you help us, we pray, in these days ahead, because we do need you so much. We need you all the time. Bless us, we pray. Speak deeply into our hearts and help us to respond accordingly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, my weak fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.